so here's where we're at. We've got yeah. the ability to generate a qubit, encode it as a photon, transmit it to the other end, decode it, and then get some it becomes data at some point, right? There, yeah. there is some, there is a data representation that has happened here just through it. the magic of quantum, but it doesn't sound very high bandwidth. It doesn't sound, you know, it sounds fraught with peril and, and issues with the physical channel losing my photons and such. So what can I do with this today? What, what are the use cases for this technology today? If, if any. Yeah. So the main use case people basically we all think about today is really in the field of cryptography. And that's because of things like what Greg said, right? If, if anyone looks at your qubit when it is being transmitted down the channel, they will intrinsically disturb that qubit. And as long as the qubit made it to the other side, um, you can see that someone has disturbed it or not disturbed it, if the case is. Right? So, so by disturbing it, that means what? Cut it, spliced into a piece of fiber to spy on what's going on through the channel? For instance, yeah. yeah. If there was uh, any other kind of receiving device, any other device that may have tried to extract data from that qubit, that would intrinsically create disturbances that would be readable. Yeah. And, and therefore, if you know that the qubit was disturbed when you finally get it on the other end, then you, you can react to that. I know that there's something exactly. bad has happened and you can, this is no longer a trusted channel. You can make decisions based on that change of state. Exactly, exactly. So <laughs> what we're all thinking about is a, there's a whole field called quantum key distribution. And the idea behind it is really, let's try to distribute uh, keys for cryptography by encoding each bit into a different photon or different qubit, sending them across the channel. We see which ones made it to the other side. And if we lose some, that's okay. That's just bits we don't use in a secret key down the road. So we kind of post select on just those qubits that made it. And then we check and we see, is there any disturbance? If there's Wait. no disturbance, then both sides now have a bit string that's identical, which they can use uh, as like an encryption key. No, wait a minute. You said if we lose yeah. bits, that's okay because we're just gonna we're gonna use we're gonna construct a yeah. key based on whatever made it to the other side. But exactly. then the origin side doesn't know what got yeah. sent. That's so sort the of receiving matters. side. The receiving side has to say back to the origin side. These are the bits that got across. Don't the 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 receiving side doesn't say what the values are. Only these ones made it. And oh, hey, okay. These are the bits that you, made it. You you know what you sent me. Fill in the you know fill in the blank. Yeah. Huh? Okay. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Okay. Yeah, and then <laughs> then it's an identical bit string. We can use this for cryptographic keys, right? So the whole there's the big field, the big application that's on everyone's mind right now is quantum key distribution uh, for for distributing these keys, like I said. And the motivation behind that uh, is actually because of another unfortunate thing that is coming up in the quantum world, and this is that quantum computers, like we said right at the start, quantum computers are very good at certain kinds of problems. And one of the things they are unfortunately very good at is breaking public key cryptography. So all the public key methods that are uh, certified today for use that are standardized, they can all be broken very quickly by a quantum computer, which means if you're using these public key distribution to distribute a key, someone with a quantum computer could crack that. Well, define very quickly. Are we talking, you know, hours, or are we still talking like some of these? If you were to try to brute force it, you're into you know, decades or you know un unrealistic amounts of compute time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So quantum computer. So and the reason behind the reason for these algorithms why they're secure is as you increase the size of your key, the time it takes with a conventional computer uh, grows exponentially. Right. Mm -hmm. With a quantum computer, it grows linearly or or better uh, or faster, which means you need basically unpractically long keys for a quantum computer to need more than minutes, most likely. <laughs> it depends on the size of the computer. There's a lot of assumptions that go into it. But uh, yeah, it's a real worry by real people in the field. There's a, there, there's a whole field that looks at how can we make conventional algorithms that are safe against quantum computers. Yeah. Mm. And the only thing really stopping that from impacting the world of security and cryptography as we know it right now is that quantum computers are very expensive and difficult to come by. Exactly. And then they're also at the moment small and uh, they don't have enough qubits inside of them yet to actually break someone's uh, public key distribution, break someone's uh, cryptographic keys. But it could happen one day. 
Uh, somebody just announced a 100 qubit computer. computer. I don't remember who it was, but yeah, nor had they demoed it yet. They just announced that they could do this. But in theory, if that's real, I suppose we're getting ever closer. We're getting closer. Yeah. Yeah. So we want to, I mean, one of the big things inside quantum computing, uh, sorry, quantum networking, quantum communication is to say, okay, we can already do at least this. We can already make this problem of key distribution go away uh, with, with quantum key distribution. Thank you.